Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study of the freedom that we have in Christ. But I've got a few uh, notes here, a uh, couple other things I want to go over, uh, including some questions that I was asked recently. Um, one was why I didn't have a whole lot to say about the uh, virus, the coronavirus. And I did mention in an earlier video, I thought I would just kind of leave that up to the experts and just focus on what I felt was really more important uh, from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say uh, about this. Um, I do believe that the kids can't stand it that the adults are in charge. Uh, you know, I know that that look that you get when you tell your family and friends that everything is normal from God's standpoint. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that we can't pray that uh, for our loved ones and our friends and and everyone that uh, this will this too will will soon pass. I have a lot of private uh, thoughts about it. Uh, uh, it's probably best that I keep those uh, under my hat because uh, this channel is, is, is really not all that interested at this point, at this stage uh, of our uh, spiritual development to, to speculate on things that I think that might or, or might not be true. I do believe that uh, uh, religion, and you, you've heard me talk a lot about the world religious system, the uh, uh, so-called... Uh, uh, modern Christianity, uh, uh, legalistic uh, uh, system that's that's based on human merit, and I, I believe that it it that it believes that a crisis draws us closer to God. Now there may be a lot of truth to that, but I'm really more I lean more heavily toward the fact that uh, that true Christianity, true spirituality believes that closeness, uh, uh, that close relationship that we have with God is really more ever present uh, and that a crisis really doesn't, a crisis doesn't change anything. It's kind of like when it comes to prayer, we're told to uh, pray constantly, uh, not just, you know, after some 9-11 event, uh, prayer, study, fellowship, uh, just go down the list. You know, every activity in the believer's life is really the norm. It's not the exception. And and I was around during 9-11, and I, I watched, you know, what happened uh, after that. And I looked at that. I, was, I took special interest, uh, special note of what took place from a, uh, a so-called American uh, religious experience. Uh, experience experience uh, you know I, I it was it wasn't long before uh, after all the prayers and everything that life was pretty much back to normal and I don't think the country really learned a whole lot uh, since then regarding that so that's all I'm going to say right now about that now I do want to say a few things concerning Trump um, you know Trump uh, as many of you know, there's a lot of sevens that follow Trump. Uh, he, he, he does take office on a January 21st. And I found it interesting, uh, intriguing, that the first known case of coronavirus in the U.S. was on January 21st. And that was three years to the day. Also uh, found it quite interesting uh, during the impeachment you know, when I was looking around at numbers and I just happened to stumble on the fact that uh, Trump was acquitted of impeachment uh, his 1,111th day in office, four ones. And then, of course, as I mentioned, then there, there's all the sevens related uh, to this president. So odd numerical occurrences really do seem to follow this president. Now, there's something else that's a little intriguing. I thought you might find this interesting, so I thought I would include it in this video. 
Um, this has to do with some strange numbers in Isaiah. Now I'm going to go ahead and read this. Uh, if you want to turn to Isaiah, uh, I believe it's, uh, I'd have to look, check and see which chapter that that is. Chapter 26. Turn to Isaiah 26, if, if you would. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 17. Now, if you look at these verses as years, uh, verse 17, 18, 19, 20, which would be the, the year that we're in now, and 21, uh, it just seems a little odd, uh, for lack of a better expression. I'll go ahead and read this. in. Verse 17, like a, as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. And this is, like I said, 17, verse 17, uh, just think 2017, the Revelation 12 sign. Now, verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain. Now, I want you to keep in mind, nothing happened. Uh, no event took place at the Revelation 12 sign. The, the event that we certainly had were, were hoping would take place did not take place. Verse 18, we've been with child. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. That's verse 18. So that's, that's also intriguing. If we go on to verse 19, Thy dead men shall live. Now notice it doesn't say thy dead, thy dead men uh, do live or will live. Or, or it doesn't say that thy dead men uh, uh, live because they rose from the dead. It says, thy dead men shall live. It's future. Verse 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. The earth shall, in the future, cast out the dead. That's verse 19. So I find that verse intriguing as well. But now we come to 20, verse 20, which is really most intriguing. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Now, I understand that there's a, a strict biblical context to these verses, but folks, you can't read verse 20 without thinking quarantine. You can't read verse 20 in the year 2020, the year we're in, and not think uh, shutdown, lockdown. So let's look at 21. 21, and, and many of you know that, uh, that I, I believe that uh, it's a high watch time, 2021, spring of 2021. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Now that's it. If you want to take note, highlight those verses and look at them closer. If you have any thoughts on those, you can email me, uh, text me, email me, call me, whatever. Just wanted to put that, include that in this video. Now, I've been asked a whole lot of questions after doing our series on Romans and Ephesians and Colossians and, you know, and parts of John, uh, uh, Jude. I've received a lot of questions concerning the uh, subject of divine election, something that is seldom taught within mainstream Christianity today. I want you to consider the fact that God chose Aaron's rod, Numbers 17.5. He 
He chose a specific kind of fast. Uh, that's in Isaiah chapter 58. The place where he would place his name, uh, Shiloh, uh, Psalms chapter 78, Jeremiah chapter 7. He chose the city of Jerusalem. I, I won't bother reading all these verses. If you want uh, references, just contact me. I'll just uh, run through this really fairly quickly. He chose the city of Jerusalem. He chose the temple. And he chose Mount Zion. He chose Abram, Isaac, Moses, Aaron. He chose the judges, uh, Gideon, Samson, uh, Barak, Samuel. Uh, he chose the kings, Saul, David, Jeroboam. He chose the prophets, Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, uh, national leaders like Pharaoh, Cyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, Zerubbabel. There's God's choice of any nation or kingdom. Uh, he chose the Persian army and he chose Assyria. God's choice of genetic corporate entities encompass uh, six specific groups. All humanity as Noah's seed in the, in the, in the Noahic covenant. He chose the nation of Israel, uh, uh, elect, uh, the elect in God's choice of Abraham's seed, Isaac's seed, Jacob's seed, the tribe of Levi, the Aaronic line, the house of Phinehas, and the Davidic line. And of course, we know Jesus chose his disciples. He chose the Apostle Paul. So please forgive me if I don't get too excited when you tell me that he didn't choose you, but that you chose him. If you want to turn to chapter 9 of Acts, uh, the 17th and 18th verses. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Notice, folks, how Ananias called Paul brother before the scales fell from Paul's eyes, before he received his sight, and was filled with the Holy Spirit, and before he was baptized. Unconditional election. Just back up a, a verse or two. Note what God told Ananias in verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Galatians 1.15 Paul himself states in Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 Paul himself says but when it pleased God now we're looking at the timing who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And of course we've got John 15 15, 15, or John 15, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So, unconditional election, irresistible grace, God's timing, not our own, And if you don't find that astounding, it's one thing to see how amazing that is just from a pure scriptural standpoint. It's another thing to be so, um, be so absolutely amazed at why you're not hearing that at most of the churches that you step into. Why is that? 
Personally, I believe that the Doctrine of Demons playbook was long ago written and the religious system, that human merit-based system today, has endorsed it, believing that it must be the truth. An entire system built upon the greatest of deceptions. And folks, that's the age we're living in. Now, I could say a lot about God's sovereign will. It's one of my favorite subjects. 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord's not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, Steve, He wants everyone to come to repentance. All men, election doesn't figure into it. They choose, not God. And you don't understand the verse. Folks, we've got to slow down. When you Anybody can read that and breeze over that so quickly that they miss the truth that that verse contains. First of all, His will... His desire that is expressed there is for all those who are His. The text, first of all, says, and if you have the authorized version, the King James says, usward, usward. Okay? That's, uh, the word there in the Greek is, is su. That's, that's, that's how it's pronounced. It's, it's sigma upsilon, uh, two letters in the Greek. And it's in the plural, you all, believers, not the non-elect. And also it's the Lord who is not willing. The verse doesn't say, here's what it doesn't say. The verse does not say the Lord is long-suffering toward uh, goats and tear who are, who are not willing that they should perish. It has nothing to do with their will. The, the, the text is talking about God's will. Not even His people are saved. Not even you or I are saved according to our own will. And none of His will perish. Now, since He is not willing any should perish, none will. Therefore, it must be referring to His people. Modern Christianity would have you believe that this refers to all men but not all men are saved. Therefore, because not all men are, are saved, that or, and I'm using that, that word saved in the sense of, of, of redemption, which I am allowed to do, just depends on the context. The word saved means delivered. I, I probably should say redeemed. Modern Christianity would have you refer would have you believe that this refers to all men, but not all men are redeemed. Therefore, because not all men are redeemed, that would mean that not all God wills will come to pass. And now we got a big, big problem. Because if not what if not everything that God wills comes to pass, you have a a, pro, a theological problem of tremendous magnitude, folks. That would mean that man's will overrides God's will, which means that Scripture just lied, okay? When it said that His will will be done in heaven and on our, on earth. Folks, we don't direct our steps. Jeremiah 10, 23 makes that absolutely crystal clear. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 33. We can, go all the, I, we can go all the way back to Jeremiah chapter 10 and see that we don't direct our steps, yet modern Christianity would have you believe that you do, that you direct your steps. They want to remove you from that realm of faith, a faith walk, to a walk of sight. Dependence upon yourself, not God. And of course, they deprive you of all of even knowing 
the blessings that you have in Christ because, I mean, God forbid they preach that because that would then, well, I, I don't know how to put this. It's amazing to me how that they think that, you know, I guess they think that, or at least many of them think that if we were to just tell you that you were fully, completely righteous in Christ, you, know, you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Uh, you're coming behind. You're lacking in no spiritual grace, no, no spiritual gift, and on and on and on it goes. Well, if we were to tell our congregants that, if we were to tell the people that, well, they'll just go out and live however they want. What they need to be telling them is that they're out there living the way that they want right now. There's not a single one of us, folks, not me, not you, not a single Christian, there's not a single Christian on the planet that's not living the way he wants. We don't always do the things that we want to do. In fact, we do the very things that we don't want to do. There's something I find very interesting about Scripture. Scripture really has little to say about anything unless, and I mean anything, it doesn't matter what book you're looking at, what chapter you're looking at, it really doesn't have a whole lot to say about anything unless what it's talking about has a direct plug-in to the, to the issue of redemption, which is the most important issue that there is. I always found it interesting, you know, can, just let's go all the way back to Genesis concerning Adam, okay, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Eden, after he had sinned, after Adam had sinned, God cried out, Adam, where art thou? You know, I don't, I don't know how many Christians... Could it be? Uh, could they be in the thousands uh, that that read that? And when they read that, they automatically their 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 the human mind just snaps to well, God just didn't really know where Adam was. Or okay, he did know, but he didn't know. He 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 chose not to know. Uh, he's God; he can do that. He can forget. He can deliberately set aside that attribute of omniscience. Why did he say that? I don't think that God was searching for fallen man whose whereabouts he surely knew. But for unfallen Adam who had simply disappeared. It was the Adam that he created, the Adam that was immortal, who was spiritually alive, who had vanished. And I, I read that and I just, I, I, I sense, I feel the heart of God. Adam, where art thou? By the way, the Hebrew word for uh, woman, I've, I've, I might have pointed this out before. In the Hebrew, it was Isha, and for man, it's Ish. So if you're a man, you're an Ish, and if you're a woman, you're an Isha. The word Ish comes from the root uh, word connoting strength, while the word uh, Isha uh, or, you know, maybe I'm getting that backwards. I'm getting confused here. The word for, for, for man, uh, the word for man, being, uh, ish, means strength. Isha, woman, comes from a root word, anash, meaning fragile. Fragile. Now, we know that, that Eve first sinned and then tempted Adam. And Adam sinned. And Scripture has a whole lot to say about how that we sinned in Adam. And someone emailed me and they asked me, you know, why not simply create an Adam and an Eve simultaneously? God could have done that. Why didn't He do that in the first place? 
why the, the, the complex procedure at, of taking and forming woman out of man as Genesis describes. Why do you do that? Well, the reason, I believe, is essentially theological, and it relates to the redemptive plan or design of God. As I said, I don't think anything Scripture says doesn't have a direct plug-in to the subject of redemption. God has a purpose for doing everything, but it's not just, you know, He doesn't just do things, well, without purpose or reason. I just think everything has to do with redemption. Adam was first born, then Eve. He was fashioned out of, out of Adam. And I, as I believe, as many scholars do, that Adam was created uh, androgynous. He, he had the, chem, the, the chemical, the... the the makeup, the genetic makeup of both male and female. And no, that doesn't mean that Adam was gay. It's just that everything was in Adam to begin with. I believe he was created that way. And since Eve was taken out of Adam, then he lost that part of that. It's not to say that men can't have some feminine characteristics. It's just that, but try to follow what I'm saying here. All men had to be derived from a single individual Adam, not from Adam and Eve as, as two separately created individuals. Okay, the, <clears throat> the human race had to originate from a single creature with one head, one head, one source, one original Adam, I mean, the creation of two separate heads, the father of the race and a mother of the race, each formed by a distinct act of creation, would result in theological complications as it concerns the incarnation, okay, God becoming man, because God didn't become man and woman, God didn't become Androg androgynous or whatever. Women had to be redeemed too. So there would have been problems in, 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 in the sense or in terms of there being a single redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. The importance of drawing Eve out of Adam and not making her a separate creation thereby meeting the exact requirement of Acts chapter 17 that God has made of one, not of one blood, all who dwell on the earth is, is clearly brought out by the fact that every individual in the world who's ever lived traces his beginning back to Adam. This is why Jesus is often referred to as the second Adam. I prefer the term last Adam. There's not going to be a third. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that too before as we go on uh, along in this study on, on our freedom that we have in Christ. I hope that you followed us through on the first uh, several videos. I mentioned, I made a mention in my last video how I was going to touch upon the, the, the idea of the so-called mysterious third person. You know, you've got, we have the old man and the new man, uh, and then uh, I suggested, I thought, that there was a third person involved. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. So here we go. Uh, I... Uh, I'm looking for the right word here. I've, I've said, I've said things in the past where people have said, you know, well, that that seems like quite a, an extemporaneous thought, uh, folks. This has been on my mind for over 30 years. This is not something new. In fact, it is so important to me that I base my uh, 
it's it's it is it's always extremely important at least it is for me that number one i always focus on what god's word says as opposed to anything else that is it's the sole authority that god wrote it not man that nothing contradicts anything else that there's a logical consistency to it that it's it's like building blocks where we can build you know a, uh, a house not on sand but on christ there must be a third person there has to be now let me back up just a moment modern christianity folks teaches you that uh, and believes and teaches that and looks at all of this primarily from the standpoint that we are it views the christian as a single natured individual i've pointed this out in the past uh, yeah you've been born again yeah you've been made a new creation in christ but you're really just still just steve you know or fred or joe or or susan or or deborah or whoever whoever okay you're just a person you're not split up into these you know you're not you're not in a bunch of split personalities you're just who you are so you're a single natured individual and and uh that of course that that faulty logic that faulty unbiblical notion l tends to dr lead us down the wrong path a wrong path of theological error which ultimately arrives at uh, a destination in, in which we don't want and that is cleaning up the, the old man just clean up yourself because you're only that one per that one entity yeah you've been made a new creation in christ but 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 God didn't really change your physical or your spiritual structure in any dynamic sense. You're just who you are. And folks, that just cannot be true. If you follow the logic of Scripture, not the logic of Steve, what you discover is that we have an old man, and that is the flesh. Let's, let's talk about the old man just for a moment. Much can be said about the old man, old nature, sinful nature, the sin nature, the old man, the flesh, of which there, there's, there, in, in which there dwells no good thing. The flesh profits nothing. It was crucified with Christ. We died to self. You know, there's the old man. And it, it is unchangeable. It's never going to improve. It's never going to get better. In fact, just the opposite it's going to become worse. If you lived uh, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, I don't think that you folks, nor I, would want to see our old man 300 years from now. Okay? Scripture says it's becoming more and more corrupt day by day. God is not interested in cleaning up the old man. In fact, God has nothing to do with the old man, the flesh. Okay? All that ugliness in your life, all of that sin, all of that horrid, just that horrid monster of self, God has nothing to do with it. You, he, you began your journey in Christ having been made a new creation, but that's not the new man. And Christians, by the score, those who have at least escaped from that mentality that we're a single-natured individual, and they'll admit, well, we have an old man and a new man, so uh, you know, so we're not the old man, so we must be the new man, and that is not correct either. And I hope to explain that uh, the best I can. We just discussed the old man. We just talked about the old man, the new man. Scripture has a lot to say about the new man. The new man is sinless, fully righteous. Couldn't become any more righteous uh, by what it does or doesn't do. It stands before God. Uh, God looks at it, God looks at that new man as sinless perfection. Okay, but that's not us. Why, Steve? Do you say that that's not us? 
Well, because to say that that's us would would then be suggesting that we we never have anything to do with the old man, and we do. And without you thinking that I'm introducing any sort of free will into this equation, because we don't have free will as it comes to the ma when it comes to the matter of redemption, God made that absolutely clear. John 1 13. Born again by the will, we're not born again by the will of the flesh or the will of man, but we're born again of by God. We do have, as new creations in Christ, and the best way I can explain this is that as new creations in Christ, we are in possession of an old man and a new man. In possession of. Okay? Because neither the new or the old chooses, quote-unquote. Try to wrap your mind around that fact. The, the, the old doesn't choose to do good or bad. All the old can do is bad, okay? The new doesn't choose to do old or bad because all that the new does is good. Are you following me? The both are bound by their unchangeable nature and they can only do what they are by nature able to do. Therefore, therefore, we as a new creation possess both an old man and a new man. We are not our new man, okay? We are a new creation in possession of both an old and new man, okay? So we make choices. We choose to be involved in one or the other. And here's where it gets interesting. Okay? I've just handed you back some responsibility here that maybe formerly you thought, well, you know, gosh, Steve, man, he's, he's so much into grace. He's, you know, he, God chose us. So he's perfected us forever. He's, you know, on and on and on it goes. So I can just sit back and I don't have to do anything. And that is not true. You will make choices. In fact, you do. You make choices every single day. And not only every day, but almost every moment of every day. You make choices. You choose to either walk in the flesh or in the spirit. Old man or new man. God has given you the freedom of choosing which you... The, that you want to be involved in. If you, I've said it before, folks. You, know, you can take the old man for a ride, but that is not you. That's not you. You are a new creation in possession of a new man, and when we look at the characteristics, the nature, the function, the characteristics, and the evidence of the new man, it is, folks, it is like, here's what it's like. It's like, it's like activating the account that you already have, okay, it's not depositing anything new into that account. Just because you make a choice to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh, you haven't changed the nature of that new man one iota. He's fully righteous. He's always been. He always will be. You haven't added to, you haven't added anything. Are you, are, I hope you're following this. You haven't added to the finished work of Christ. You're not adding anything to it. I'll say it again. It's like, it's like activating the account that you already have. The new man, fully righteous, okay, cannot sin. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, It is not I but sins, but sin which dwells in me. We read John saying in 1 John that his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. Who cannot sin? The new man. All the old man does is sin. So, we're told that to walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. 
And folks, I've pointed this out before. It's not, you know, walking according to the flesh is not just going to, you know, bars, okay? Or just go down your list, whatever, you know, whatever. It's not doing all that worldly stuff, playing poker, you know, on Sunday, whatever. Walking according to the flesh primarily, first and foremost, is walking according to law. Why? Because flesh and law are so inseparably connected, okay? Related. They, they, they function together. They, they go together. They're married to one another, law and flesh. It's not that the law is bad. The law is, is holy, just, and good. It's just that you cannot keep the law. It was never even given to you in the first place. But you died to the law in order that you might bear fruit unto God. How do we do that? How do we do that? By choosing to, to be involved in all of those activities that are commensurate with the new man, okay? Because we have been made new creations in Christ. And that is freedom in Christ, folks. We have the freedom to live and serve Him despite the old, all, the old, all the ugliness of that old sin nature that was crucified with Christ. We have the freedom to live, to love, to serve one another, and to serve God, to worship God, unhindered, okay, because everything that God could have possibly done, because it's, it's all centered in His Son, and we have been given His life. It's His life that is lived out in and through us as we walk by faith, and all that God has said is true of us in our new man as new creations in Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope this, this at least sh sheds some light on where I'm coming from. And, and as usual, I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything concerning this mysterious third person. Folks, we are living in an age which, in which I believe, this is just what I believe, I believe that modern Christianity as a whole has departed so far from its roots, from its founding, from its beginning, that it's, it's almost com compared to the picture that we see in Scripture, of, it's just almost unrecognizable. This is why so many people, they they'll pick up their Bible and they'll, they'll, they'll start reading and, and, and they'll right away, right away that they see that, that the life that is described in this book uh, for the Christian is so far removed from their experience that they can't even begin to, to, to grasp how that they could possibly attain, okay, that's a good word, attain to that level of spirituality. Well, of course, that's the truth. That's the beauty of it is we can't, but Christ did. And He loves you and I love you. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.